Hello, welcome to Sad and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of The Doppelganger Gambit by Lee Killow. This is a book that came out in 1979. It is a classic sci-fi from Del Rey. As this is one of my classic sci-fi book reviews, I'm going to be doing a spoiler-free review at the start, followed by my classic sci-fi bingo, where I get into kind of the nitty-gritty of the book, because there's a lot to talk about about this book. I, I really liked it. <laughs> so this book is an absolute joy to read. It was fun, fast, futuristic enough to be sci-fi, but restrained in its vision, and pleasing to me, delightfully lacking in sexism. <laughs> is the cover not amazing? It's, it's an amazing cover. It's like a piece, it's like a work of art. It's so cool. So what is the book about? The ultimate alibi. The starship broker OD'd on a particularly nasty drug and his files showed his personal responsibilities for a series of space disasters. Suicide? Policewoman Jana Brill was ready to buy that, but her oddball sidekick, Mama Maxwell, smelled murder on the dead man's partner. And Mama Maxwell, for all his bizarre antics, had a reputation for being right. The trouble was, the suspect had to be in the clear. The giant computer that kept hour-by-hour hour track of every citizen provided him an absolute alibi. To nail the man, Mama would have to prove the computer wrong and knock out the keystone of law and order for an entire country. <laughs> it's not really about that. Uh, okay. So this is a detective story, but rather than the reader trying to figure out, you know, who was the murderer all along, we already know who the murderer is and what his motivation is because he gets a point of view in the story. We've obviously seen this before. It's not the most common way of doing a murder mystery, but you know, it, those, those do exist. <laughs> and this book really, really pulls it off. The fun part of this novel is watching how the cops piece together the clues while we cheer them on. The tension lies in not whether they will find the guy, but what happens when they close in. The characters are great. Villain is easily unlikable with motivations that aren't the most unique, but they're totally understandable. The side characters are varied and interesting, with differing backgrounds that show off the interesting future that Killo has created. The best characters, though, are of course our main character, Jana Brill, and her partner, Mama Maxwell. It's a pairing that always works well in cop stories. The straight-laced, ambitious, by-the-book cop and the live wire does stuff based on intuition and isn't afraid to cross moral lines, cop. <laughs> Jana is great. Just because she's by the book doesn't mean she's not tough as nails. She's feisty and fiery and not afraid to tell people off. Mama is great because he's super chill yet also super skilled. They are a fun pair and they are often quite funny together. This isn't a super in-depth story about these two and their backstories. We pretty much learn nothing about their backstories, but they're a fun characters because they, they're archetypes, but they also are a bit unique in that regard as well. So it's a great blend of like something you know with something that's a little bit different. What I found fascinating about this book is the attention to detail on the police work and how the smallest of things leads to the pair leads the pair in the right direction. The world building is just excellent. There are so many fun aspects from the big stuff like generation ships to the strange cars and clothes. It's reminiscent of Blade Runner in a way, but not as dark. It's just every aspect of the world has been thought through in terms of how you know things would change in the future. There are some funny things, the most being that in the future, the conspiracy theory today about electronic currency, you know, being our, our downfall, is pretty much true in this world. <laughs> uh, what does it say here? Okay. He pulled out his case he pulled his case card out of a breast pocket and took out his scrib card. He flexed it, wishing he could break it in two. For all the benefits it entitled him to in, a, in social care and financial transactions, the card was a curse. In the process of eliminating cash from society, personal freedom had been strangled. By checking bank records, investigators could learn where any particular person had been at any given time. Purchase records were a fatal giveaway. I mean, that's kind of the conspiracy that my dad likes to talk about. Um, about how if there's, you know, no cash, everything's being tracked. And I'm just like, oh, God, everything's being tracked anyway. Google's tracking your phone. Uh, anyway, there is another part in the story that I thought was kind of funny. I mean, the actual situation is not funny at all. There's this guy who's freaking out on dust, which is basically like PCP, in an apartment building, and he's like shooting at people. But then we get this exchange between a bunch of people at this horrible kind of event, and I laughed out loud. I had to. So, um, okay, so a bunch of people are shooting, and the cops are shooting back, all this stuff. Okay. In another minute, everyone was bringing out shotguns and moving up behind the cover cars. The girl screamed, don't kill him, he doesn't mean to hurt anyone. Don't damage the building, the manager called. <laughs> 
And what's funny is that this comes back like three or four times. The cops are like, they break a window to get in to get to this guy. So they don't have to like kill him. They just have to subdue him. And then she's like, you broke the window. How dare you break the window? It's so expensive to replace windows. It's like, meanwhile, like <laughs> everyone that could have died. Anyway, the best part though about this book is the author bio because it has a very funny line at the start. So Lee Callow is a five foot seven inch redhead who began her love affair with words and tales very early in her Kansas childhood. I just love that how it puts her height. <laughs> Why do we need to know that? <laughs> anyway, if you're looking for an enjoyable classic sci-fi that won't make you cringe, you should check this out. I really enjoyed it. It's probably my favorite one I've read so far this year, I think. I'd have to look at all the ones I read because I can't remember, but definitely, definitely in the top two. <laughs> So I'm going into my classic sci-fi bingo. I don't, I don't know if this is gonna get a bingo, I can't remember. So first of all, outdated science. Amidst all the stuff you're talking about later, they still have payphones. <laughs> the funny thing about this isn't that payphones exist because they do exist here, but they weren't really adapted to the technology. So you have to, because it's a cashless society, you have to somehow purchase a token to use the phone, which I thought was just wild. Like they were like, okay, we can conceive of a cashless society, but how would payphones work? I'm like, would they just use that scrib card? Anyway, I mean, payphones aren't that outdated, but uh, they are kind of rare. I saw one for the first time a little bit ago and my kids were like, what's that? I was like, it's a phone, but of course they wouldn't know. <laughs> uh, spaceship, no, there's no spaceships. Uh, there are, but they're not really. I mean, I guess one does technically blow up, but it blows up kind of in passing when they talk about it having blown up. It's not like it blows up during the course of the story. Uh, social changes, um, yes, lots of them. Sexism, racism, and homophobia appear to be gone. It's the Star Trek future, the best future. <laughs> the cops come from all backgrounds and there's no implication that race, sex, gender, anything has impact on people's chances for advancement or fair treatment. There's no slurs used in this book. Uh, yeah, um, it was quite refreshing actually, for, especially for a book from 1979. Especially since I've read books from the 90s that have a ton of that stuff. Um, I've talked about this before, how it's like a pendulum. And uh, it's interesting though, when you find the 60s and 70s I found were way more progressive than the 80s and 90s. Anyway, uh, there's some fun stuff. So this isn't gonna be the United States anytime soon, but uh, this happens in the book. The first customer at the pharmacy, an attractive young woman, perceived embarrassed that she handed Jana a prescription slip for pro prostaglandin, whatever those are, supposit suppositories. <laughs> Jana wondered whether the woman was embarrassed about having become pregnant or sufficiently influenced by lifist and Bible cultist propaganda to feel guilty about aborting herself. Yeah, so apparently in the United States, you can go to the pharmacy and get the abortion pill, which you can do in a lot of countries now, but obviously not in the States anytime soon. Sorry, everyone down there. Um, yeah, so another interesting thing that's obviously not gonna happen anytime soon in the States. Uh, is that you can buy all kinds of drugs. You can buy hallucinogens. You can buy mescaline, uh, phylocybin, LSD, STP, MDT, and LLR. I don't know what the last three are. I'm assuming there's something else. Um, <laughs> at the pharmacy as well. You can't buy dust or uh, trick, which is the big murder um, drug in this book. So basically the main character villain, he, uh, so basically the main villain, he puts this trick drug, which is an insane hallucinogen kind of acid on acid uh, in his coffee and he drinks it and he has like a bunch of spasms and dies. And then, um, yeah, so it's ruled as like a suicide overdose. But um, yeah, so that's kind of like the, the first murder in the book. There's two murders. <laughs> there is one thing I found weird and confusing. Um, so John has some phone calls to clear up because she is a cop. She's not just a de detective. So one of the batteries punched off in a fury when Jen explained that rape was no longer a criminal charge. Sexual assaults were all prosecuted as batteries. I don't understand how that could ever come about, <laughs> but okay. Uh, I was like, is this supposed to be like, what, why, <laughs> why? I mean, the other two, I understand those are personal choices, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. There's also another interesting thing about um, the United States, Oakland specifically. Uh, let's see here. Where is it? Okay. So he goes through a study. He gets out of 22. He regarded the weapon for a moment. 
the gun was not only noisy, but this particular one could be traced to him. As a part of maintaining a license on it, he had to leave a new test bullet with the police department every 50 firings or every six months. The image of any bullet removed from a body was routinely run through a ballistics computer, he knew, and compared to the images of the test bullet stored in its memory. So that's interesting. <laughs> the cops also don't even have guns. They just have like tasers and stun guns. They do have uh, like shotguns they keep in the back of cruisers for like tactical time. But on their like regular just kind of walking around, they don't have guns, which is kind of um, definitely not United States. Uh, okay, so do we have a sexy female scientist? We do not have any sexy scientists. Uh, we don't have any aliens. That means we don't have any alien human romance. <laughs> is there a generation ship? Yes. So Britta's partner at the start is supposed to go to a new planet on a generation ship. Uh, basically, they'll arrive. They're going to go in cryo and they're going to wake up where Jonna is like, you know, an old lady. Uh, he and his wife want Jonna to go with and kind of her whole deal in the book is deciding like, do I want to go? Do I not want to go? That kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's no space soldiers. There's no AI. New worlds. There's a mention of one, but we don't see it. So no. Um, cyberpunk, no, it's not tech heavy enough. It's also not like sexy enough. It's, it's not really a cyberpunk. Sexism, no. There's not even androcentrism, which is when, you know, like mankind, things like that. <laughs> but even better, we have women all over the place. So I'm so used to women in these books, like from this, these time periods, never having women as just casual characters, that when they said things like the doctor or the governor, I just assumed it was a dude. And it wasn't. Most of the time it was a woman. And I was like, this book is great. <laughs> also, we have an interesting thing on page 64. Okay. So there's a doll this guy wants to buy for his daughter. It was the dark beauty of the doll that attracted him. Until he read the biographical booklet that came with the doll, he had not known that the most famous shuttle jockey in the world was a black woman. I don't know what a shuttle jockey is, but good for her. <laughs> uh, foreigner technology, no, there's none of that. LGBTQ+, yes. Oh my god, finally. <laughs> this is one of the first times in reading classic sci-fi the last few years, because I've really been reading, what, like three or four years now, um, that I've come across like unequivocal queer normativity. <laughs> I mean, there's some stuff that's good natured, but just like a little weird, but you could tell the intent was to have, you know, the queer relationships completely normalized. And I thought that was great. First of all, Brennan's roommate is a gay dude, um, which was awesome. And she talks about how she loves having a gay roommate because he won't steal, you know, um, her men, which I thought was funny. Uh, there's also, okay, so this guy is, is embarrassed because someone saw him at a mix and match party which i guess is just like an orgy or something like that and then um so a bunch of stuff happens he's all upset and janice says that man was a fool he either ought to confess his by preference to his wife or accept the monogamous sacramental marriage he had made with her that anyone in this permissive time would allow himself to be hagrined by grilt over sexual needs was to her ridiculous so i guess it shows that uh you know, <laughs> it's normal to be gay in this world. Can I, can I move there? Yeah, so that was a uh, totally different than usual. <laughs> Normally we get no mention of gay people whatsoever. Uh, portals, nope, no portals. Microfeast, yes. <laughs> micro viewers and other micro things abound in this book. Of course, some just mean small, like a micro camera, but others clearly are based on microfiche. And I was like, yes, <laughs> my baby, the microfiche. Uh, male MC is a dick? No, because the male main character is a woman. She's not a man at all. Racial equality? Yep, I kind of explained that already. Yes, totally. Future weapons? Yes. Uh, there's float cars, which are basically just, um, bullet on the half shell, some wet had called the float car design, for the way the sleek fiber plastic body poised in the middle of the airfoil spreading skirt. The vehicles were conspicuously marked with white tops, black bodies, and a light reflecting red stripe circling the body just below the windows. Okay, so that was had to be about the cop cars. But yeah, they're, uh, they're like just like hover cars. What is great is that they were apparently made by Datsun Ford. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, if you don't know cars, you won't get it. But basically, Datsun changed their name to Nissan in 1981, like two years after this book was printed. <laughs> <laughs> my dad had a Datsun 240Z when I was a kid. That car was so cool. I asked him when I was 19 or so, like where it was, because I was like, I want it. And he was like, oh, it's rotting in a field somewhere, probably. A tragedy in five words, I swear to God. <laughs> There's also a fun invention in this book. The plastic was the invention of another colleague friend of hers. He had developed it to be painted on the body to cover and protect the wearer so he or she could appear nude and it'd be warm even in cold weather. 
Its porous nature was designed to keep the wearer from cooking to death inside. <laughs> unneeded, uh, an unneeded technology. That's fine. There's no post-apocalyptic, no bounty hunters, no galactic war tech like today. Yes, we have Bluetooth. I don't need to explain it. We have Bluetooth. They also have Zoom and video calling. In typical classic sci-fi fashion, they believe all phone calls have just turned into video calls. No, no. We have all realized that no one wants that. <laughs> no one wants someone to call and you answer and it's instantly video call. That is like my worst nightmare. It's like I pick it up and then, you know, I see my face. And I'm like, oh God, look, there's Shrek. Uh, okay. Uh, there's also DVR. I, that's what's called when you can like rewind live TV, right? Because that's what they have. You can like rewind live TV. They did not have that in 1979, <laughs> but I think we have that now. I don't know. Uh, the Bechtel test. Yes. Women talk to one another about stuff other than men a ton of times in this book. It is very nice. <laughs> hey, we have a bingo. Honestly, I wasn't expecting that with this book. I thought there wouldn't be a lot to talk about because everything about it was like so good <laughs> as opposed to me like making fun of the stuff that was like so bad. So yeah, yay, yay doppelganger game, but good for you. It's the first time in a long time we've had a bingo. Uh, for my quick quick bonus, I don't really need to do it, but you know, there's no reptiles there's no convergent evolution. There is a female main character though. You know, I don't know why I put these three things together because, you know, having convergent evolution and reptile aliens is probably hard. I mean, I, I guess, I guess it still is kind of convergent if they're bipedal and they breathe oxygen and they're mammals, I guess. You know what? Maybe I will revamp the bingo a little bit. Maybe I'll put reptile aliens up where hu alien human romance is and put that down. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll like do a new one in the new year and I'll move things around. So yeah. Anyway, uh, those are just my thoughts. And uh, yeah, so thanks for watching and uh, check this out. I am depressed now actually because I had a chance to buy the second one of this and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> Why is it being so cheap? Look, the book was two ninety five. I couldn't spend three bucks to buy the second one, like in a hope that this one was good. I don't know. Unless I do have it. Goes back here. No. No, I don't think I do. Oh. Oh well. Uh, thank you.